What's up, y'all? <laughs> you know what time it is. It's about to be that time. Damn, son, where'd you find this? And we're back. One Piece 1078 is out, and it feels like the last couple of chapters of Wano because Oda's on a murder spree. First, Shaka, the boy. I knew it wasn't you. I knew you weren't the traitor, Shaka. We love you over here. But now, Pythagoras. Moment of silence for Pythagoras. That's enough time. Who cares about Pythagoras? Anyway, the traitor is Yoke. York. I always liked the translation better that the name was Yoke because we're on Egghead. And, um, you know, man's got the yoke. Can you ask an egg, how do you have your yoke? You can't. Either man's got the yoke or man ain't got the yoke. Man's got the yoke. Yeah. As always, a ton of implications for everything, and now that we know that it is York, we're gonna double down on some of the ideas that we presented last week and do a you know a fuller character analysis on York and why they would be going about this. How exactly did this happen? When did they get exactly here? We're gonna go through the timeline of it all. And there's probably gonna be a lot of poop jokes. Nani. So you ready for that. First, like, comment, subscribe if you're feeling the vibe. The brain. It's a very powerful tool. And Vegapunk decided to chop his up and take pieces of his brain and put them into robots that he had created. Essentially, Michael Keaton in the movie Multiplicity. He didn't have the time to do everything that he needed to do, so he created Lilith, Shaka, Pythagoras, Edison, Atlas, and York. But the thing is, is that the brain is powerful, and every little bit of it has a job to do. Whether Vegapunk was too naive to realize, even though he was the smartest man in the world, he was accentuating particular traits in each and every one of these particular satellites. Before. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. York, as we've been told, is the embodiment of his greed. Everything, every greedy thought that Vegapunk has ever had is all just manifested into this one being. They've become sentient. And now, they want to become a celestial dragon. And they're ready to sell out all of their brothers and sisters and their father to get what they want. They're out for number one. And this is ironic, right? Because York is the satellite that was created to specifically be not out for number one. York's job was to do number one and number two for everybody else. Who does number two work for? Who? Does number two work for? That's right, buddy. You show that turn who's boss. If York ever had any inklings of wanting something for themselves, everybody else, including the main Stella, would have been like, yeah, so about that. That's not your job, okay? You were built to do this. Four things. Eat, sleep, piece of shit. Like, that's it. That's your job. So go and do that. Don't have any thoughts of, you know, being more than what you are. Focus on that and everything's going to be good. We're going to handle the rest of the stuff and just remember you're still a part 
of the big man. But York is a big girl, and she wants a life of her own. Main Stella Vegapunk mentioned that York had been to Marijoa and witnessed the Celestial Dragons. Now keep this in mind, right? York is someone that has been constantly told what to do. They just have to repeat the cycle. When they saw the Celestial Dragons, who can't be told what to do, that lit this fire. They don't want to be a Celestial Dragon as much as they just want to be able to have agency. And that was the vehicle of what they believe is the most agency in the world. No one will be able to tell me what to do if I'm one of them. What she doesn't know is that there's an order to kill all of the Vegapunks, including her. So, womp womp womp, right? But when you're so greedy, you're definitely blinded by what's in front of you. The reveal of York being the traitor is very similar to the Conjurer reveal, right? We have this character that was presented to us one way, and then you flip it on, you know, its head, and you, you, you get this massive change. This is why I said it was probably the most likely outcome, even though it wasn't my favorite. But the other thing, too, is I don't think that York is able to do this alone. And here's where we're going to actually get into the timeline of everything. Now, I've gone back several chapters to kind of track York's movement through the story, and there is no instance where we could ever see York giving a directive to the Seraphim. The last person to communicate with the Seraphim is Edison, and we've never seen the Seraphim get another order after that. And if you're on the same plane in the Authority chip, you can't change that. So that's why I've been suspicious of Edison this whole time. Sorry to, you know, particular members in the community that love Edison. Still hasn't beat the allegations, all right? I know he's packed up, but you know what? York was also turned to stone. There's a larger plan going on here. And just like we, you know, did some time manipulation here and went back in time to learn about different things, we'll eventually, like, you know, get the, the Kaiser Soze of it all and we'll understand what's going on here. And I do believe that York isn't acting alone. Edison could very well be in on this. Atlas could be in on it. I do not believe that Shaka was in on it. Lilith, I'm starting to really believe is just the red herring, even though they're supposed to be the evil side of everything. I think it really is just more order and chaos like we were talking in the stream. And the interactions between Lilith and Usopp were just too genuine, too good in the last chapter, so I'm not really believing that. In 1075, when York got petrified, there was a bit of confusion amongst the community because they figured that S. Snake had actually blown up York. But even then, I was talking about the geography of it all. York was behind S. Snake, whereas Usopp, Frankie, Lilith, and Pythagoras were on the other side of the bridge. She blew up the bridge, they all fell, but S. Snake and York were both on the other side of the bridge that wasn't blown up for more than enough time for S. Snake to depetrify York so that she could get downstairs to kill Shaka. Then S. Snake goes and, you know, starts fighting Usopp, Lilith, Frankie, and Pythagoras. Prior conversation would have had to have been made to basically say, hey, I need to make this look good, so come over here, you're going to turn me into stone, and then you're going to depetrify me when everybody is gone. This may have also been a directive that came from Edison at some point as well. Edison also may have been playing the role of martyr, like, hey, make it look good. And then now, you know, Nami's holding him. And then there's also that Atlas is bringing Robin and Chopper to York right now. Bringing Robin, the other person that the world government wants alive. So it's, there's a lot here. Could Atlas and York be working together? Sure. Could they not be working together? Sure. But either way, I'm expecting a York versus Atlas fight at some point because they're the, the two giant satellites. Right, so that would be fun. And we can get that fight either way. Whether Atlas is working with York or not, 
because York plans on being the only Vegapunk, so they would betray anybody that's helping them to begin with. And if they're not working with York, they're the embodiment of wrath. Vegapunk's in a, a cage? Hey, guess what? We're scrapping. It's as simple as that. The rest of the chapter. Things are not looking good for my desire to have Stussy be evil in this arc. I think her power is too broken to be on our side. And I wanted her to be involved in this whole trying to, you know, kill Shaka, kill Vegapunk, everything like that. I wanted her to be involved in that. And it's all like a, a bigger triple cross with the world government. What we got instead was a friendly conversation between Stussy and Sentamaru about everything that's going on here and that this really could be the next Ohara. Get the innocence out of here. Stussy seems to be good. All right. Whatever, I'll hold that. Sanji. That's what I'm talking about. It's fantastic. Top tier Sanji moment. Definitely, definitely makes up for last week. Last week wasn't that great. And in three short panels, we got an excellent Sanji moment. This man took what appears to be some Fishman Karate to the face didn't flinch, arms crossed, Superman pose. That all you got, buddy? Cigarette unfazed. Armament cigarettes? Maybe. Sanji is about to go off, and he is probably not going to have a tough time with this fight. Why? Because this isn't the real fight. We had a whole narration tell us that everything that's going to happen here is going to take a day. We're going to be here for a full day. This fight is light work. Sanji's gonna move past this because he's going to have another fight on his hands that should challenge him. He's got other things to do. He's the sneaky guy that needs to get everybody out of the situation. And I just hope that in the midst of all of that, he changes his clothes. Yep, I'm not gonna stop talking about that. S-Hawk has disappeared. The implication here is that Kuma popped them somewhere. Where would they go? Lucci tells us that they're going off to find the weaker members, okay? So who would those be? Now, he could show up and try to slash and hack the already petrified Usopp, Lilith, and Frankie, but what's the fun in that? In that particular instance, I would still like a snake to break Frankie so that we have to put him back together. Let's get that drama. Maybe that's why we're here for a day, because some people are working on rebuilding Frankie in the middle of all of this. Nami is being protected by Sanji. There's a possibility that S-Hawk does show up there, and then Sanji becomes distracted. So while he's faring very well against one Seraphim, if there are two there, maybe things could get a little dicey. The most likely option and I'll tell you my favorite one after this one, the most likely option is that Atlas, Robin, and Chopper do make it to the basement and run into York. And that's when S. Hawk pops in. Because then we're dealing with some danger. Because Robin and Chopper are not gonna fare very well against S. Hawk. So Zoro, who naturally gets lost anywhere, is going to have to somehow get from the top floor all the way to the bottom floor very fast. How is that going to happen? Well, Oda's just going to have to figure that out for us. Favorite option, and this requires a couple of machinations, and we talked about this in the stream briefly, but in the archipelago, which is what we're inverting and we're changing everything here, Zoro is about to kill Charlos, right? And he gets stopped by Bonnie. He gets saved by Bonnie. In this arc, I need a scene where Zoro saves Bonnie. Flip it on its head, reverse it. If S-Hawk is pulling up to Bonnie while she is, you know, discontent from everything that just happened in Memory World, that could be fun. S-Hawk pulls up, Zoro comes in, he's saving Bonnie from that, that's fun. If Kizaru and Garcia pull up as well, and then Kaku is there and he flips sides and now we have, you know, this wild battle royale where everybody's going against Zoro. That would be pretty fun. Like, that's the kind of stuff I really want to get into in this arc. Rook is going into his soul form, which is for plot reasons that are unknown to us. It could be that 
Brooke finds where the basement is and is Zoro's compass, basically. <laughs> Tells Zoro that he needs to get to the bottom floor if S-Hawk is down there, right? If S-Hawk makes it to the basement, tell Zoro. Zoro just starts cutting holes in the floor, maybe? I mean, that would be a fun feat, too. I'm okay with that. And he cuts through the paw room. I, you know, now that I'm thinking about it more, Zoro needs to go to the paw room. Like, he should see that. He knows what that is. Something happened. Zoro's got to get to the paw room. I don't know. The more I think about it, Zoro in the paw room. That, that needs to happen. Zoro is getting closer. We see Dahl is actually on their way, as well as three new unnamed vice admirals. But hey, don't worry. Yamil in the stream asked me to give them names, and I said, I got you. My man who looks like a biker with the two-tone beard, that's Skunkman. Yeah. Biker Skunkman. A guy who looks like a bootleg Germa version of Drake. That's Frake. Fake Drake. Yeah. Frake. And then my man with 50 chins, that's Gilly Chin. A play on Gilligan. Gilly Chin, Skunkman, and Frake are on their way. Oda, make a cannon. Let's go. All right, let's try to break down this narration a little bit. Three months ago, York going behind Vegapunk's back, like, hey, look, this guy is looking into the Void history. I'm tired of being the bathroom slave for these guys. I want to be like you guys. So why don't you come kill them and then bring me with you, even though you're going to kill me too. Let's go. Whoever York was on the phone with was like, uh, I don't know who I'm talking to. Bye. A gotcha. little bit of time goes by. York picks up a snail, says, I want to speak to your supervisor. Somehow gets on the phone with the Gorosei after, you know, a lot of calls. And they take York seriously. The weird part about this is that Oda tells us that there's going to be an incident here, which, you know, if you've been following the channel, you know, we knew there was going to be an incident here. It's the timeline. He says that we are in the day before the incident. How are we going to be here for 24 hours? Because it's going to be a war. We've got 100 ships and we're not leaving. We're scrapping and then we're leaving. Maybe. This is interesting. I love this. This is where we really need to start the civil war within the Marines. Especially if one of these Vegapunks becomes the game master of everything that's going on. Kind of becomes like Saw on the inside. Closing doors, different things like that. Five Night at Freddy's, like opening doors. How do we maneuver and move around there in the control room just doing all of this wild stuff? while the Marines are trying to capture, you know, the Straw Hats and everything, and they're trying to take them down, but then they're also getting caught into the traps of Vegabunk because York finds out that they're also trying to kill her. There are ways to make this very interesting. Ultimately, we're probably going to get to a situation where the island has a self-destruct button and it's going to activate a timer and everybody needs to get off, but they're all trapped in different things, and somehow we get out, probably due to Sanji's ingenuity. As far as the next chapter is concerned, I'm expecting a lore dump from York. A different type of dump than they're used to doing, but explaining exactly the Kaiser Soze of it all, for those who have seen Usual Suspects, like taking us through the motions, maybe revealing another traitor, explaining the conversation that they had with S. Snake, doing the Bond villain speech until Atlas and Robin and Chopper show up. Cue in maybe the reveal which way or the other where Atlas stands in all of this. S. Hawk shows up, maybe. Brooks, you know, Ghost shows up. Then he has to direct Zoro down there. You know, it, we need to deal with all of this Vegapunk stuff to a certain degree before the Marines get here now. And I understand now what Oda was trying to do because I've been waiting for the Marines to mess this up. But this is just the precursor. Most of these Vegapunks are not going to be part of the action once we really start getting into it. Unless Pythagoras and Shaka, you know, all get up and say, we're all against you, Stella. We're a united front against being slaves. 
uh, we'll see what happens. You know, I made the Saw reference, but now that Shaka's dead body is in the room, I really don't want him to get up at, like, a certain point. Like, and spoilers for Saw. Doing a lot of movie references today. And I'm going to wrap things up there, guys, because I am rambling. <laughs> but, you know, it's fun to ramble. There, uh, This is one of those chapters where it's like, this is a we-need-to-talk chapter, for sure. Uh, so, shout-out to everybody that supports the channel. All of our members, the new and or returning members, Asad Ishmael, Terry Bull TJ, Jeffrey Ortiz, DJ Red Comet 369, and Fable's Lawyer. Appreciate everybody. And I will see you for 1079 this Sunday. Yep. You know, that's we're Zolo boys now. You haven't caught the memo yet. <laughs> like, comment, subscribe. You're feeling the vibe. Later. I've been swimming deep, deep. Savage. Savage.